Welcome, Jeff Johnston with the Living Undeterred Project podcast. I'm so excited to speak to Ryan today. <laughs> I texted him earlier. I'm like a kid in a candy store because I'm on such a, we're both advocates and, but I'm, I'm such on a high learning curve right now. And I, as a, as a dad with a lived experience, um, really am interested in being around the brightest minds and the, the visionaries, the people that are out there, you know, literally knocking on doors, making a difference. And Ryan, your name just how I stumbled into you is comical. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit, but again, welcome to the show. And I, I'm so honored to have you on the podcast because we have a lot of things to talk about. There's a lot of misery and despair out there and you provide a glimpse of hope. And I followed you around on your tour and was just, um, amazed on, uh, what you left behind, uh, the wake of, of positive, uh, optimism out there in the recovery space. So again, welcome to the living on podcast. How are you doing from, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada today? I'm good. It's great to be here. And it's always, I, you know, I love meeting new friends and I think, you know, one of the, the highlights of 2022 is probably when you had reached out, uh, and we connected, um, you know, throughout the year and, and just learning more about you and what drives you to do what you do and living undeterred and, and its mission and purpose and, you know, what some of the goals you're looking at has, has been really kind of breath of fresh air for me. Um, but I'm, I'm good, you know, I'm good. Um, it's a little cold in Las Vegas today, but, um, I'm good. I'm, I'm happy to be on this podcast. Finally, it feels like we've been trying to do this for years and now we're finally able well, to do it. <laughs> I'm busy, but then there's Ryan Hampton busy. So it's a different level of busy, but Hey, we, we are here today and uh, I know the, my followers and listeners are going to be in for a real treat. Um, you've, you've came from literally nowhere from 2016 to where you are today, you know, stratospheric type rise into the advocacy space. And I mentioned earlier how I met you was almost comical as I was doing some research on, I thought I was the only crazy person to get an RV and drive around the United States, you know, <laughs> and, uh, I was on YouTube looking around I see these two guys in this RV and I thought addiction across America, I got to watch this. So I watched your YouTube, uh, mini series and I thought I got to meet this guy. I have to meet this guy. And that's how I first really fell into your lap in regards to what you're doing. And I tell you, Ryan, you were so far ahead of the, of the game in 2016, when you did your, your tour. Um, let me go back to that moment and talk maybe to my followers about what you did, why you did it. And a little bit about Ryan and your lived experience, which I know quite well. Yeah. Um, well, where do I start? I mean, I, certainly didn't anticipate um that tour to really have the longevity um that it's had in terms of impact um really i think with many of us who jump into this work you know we consider ourselves what you would call accidental advocates like nobody mm. wants this job right like nobody mm. wants to do it nobody plans for it we just kind of end up there by accident and um, I think my entire journey has been um, by accident, you know, and it just turns into another thing and another thing and another thing. But really, when I think about, you know, where the values come from today, from what I do and why I do it, um, it hasn't changed much. You know, the, the agenda has certainly changed a lot, but the values and the principles um, remain the same as to where they were. Uh, in spring of 2016, when, when we decided that that summer we were going to go on this trip. Um, so to give you like a little bit of background, um, I certainly didn't, uh, plan or grow up wanting to be a heroin addict, <laughs> um, right. for lack of a better term, really. Um, it wasn't really in the cards for me. Um, I came from a pretty decent household, um, you know, two parents who loved me very much. Uh, my mother was a, a school teacher, public school teacher. My father was a stockbroker. Um, we had our fair share of uh, trauma in our family, uh, which is something that I've been talking about more and more um, over the last, you know, two years. Um, you know, my dad actually went to federal prison when I was uh, 13 years old, uh, and he was hmm. there for three and a half years. Um, he had committed a, a range of securities frauds, 
uh, when I was mm. growing up and kind of found out, you know, at a young age that this whole uh, mm. life that I was brought up with was essentially on a lie, you know? Mm. Um, and when dad went to prison, my mom kind of had to pick up the pieces and, um, you know, we, we moved a lot, um, lost our house, you know, I switched schools a lot. Um, there was I didn't know that about you, Ryan. Yeah. I didn't know that about you. Do. There was a, there was a lot going on when I was a kid Yeah, and, you know, kind of buried under, underneath that also. And it's something I've talked about more recently and openly too. I don't talk about it in either of my books, but from, you know, age uh, roughly around age eight to age 12, you know, I was also a victim of, of pretty severe childhood sexual trauma. Um, yeah. And so there were like all these things going on. And one of the things my mom and my dad tried to do uh, very unsuccessfully was to make the appearance that the, to the outside world that nothing was wrong, nothing had changed. Mm. In fact, when my dad went to prison, um, my mom had told me that my mom and my dad together had sat me down and told me and my sisters that dad had received a new job offer and it was overseas uh, and that he was oh, going to wow. be going away for a while um and we wouldn't see him but he would write us letters um and it would be hmm. hard to talk because i mean this was in the early 90s and you know i mean it, we didn't have this you know internet phone calls and all that stuff but the dad would stay in touch but he had to do that he had to take this other job and how old were you at this time again uh i was 13 um wow so i was 13 wow. and uh it wasn't until two years in I was 15 or even maybe 16, um, two or three years in, um, to my dad being away that, uh, the phone rang one Saturday morning and, um, it was like super early and I picked it up and my mom was asleep and, uh, it was a collect call from an air force base, uh, in Tampa, Florida from someone named Bill. And I thought this was just so awkward and I didn't hmm. accept it. And I hung up the phone and, um, when my mom woke up, I said, Hey mom, um, there was a collect call from an air force base from someone named Bill. So I just hung it up. Maybe it was a prank or whatever. And like her face turned red and mm. she sat me down and she was like, that's your dad, you know, mm. and started crying. Wow. She was like, we wanted to tell you this for a long time, but dad's, you know, not at another job and he's not overseas. He's at this air force base, which actually was only like a hundred miles away from our house. Wow. And, uh, he's in prison and like, wow, that was just like a whole bag of bricks on me. Um, and I think from that moment on, like people ask, like, why are you so interested in politics and community organizing? And like, why, like, what's your affinity towards, towards that type of work? And, um, I was always looking for something to keep me off focus of dad in prison issues going on at home. Hmm. And, um, the way that I found that outlet was I would volunteer on political, I was a weird kid. I'd volunteer on political campaigns. I'd volunteer in, you know, congressional offices and any, anything that like after 3 PM when that school bell rang that I could go to that was like government related or political related or like extracurricular, like I would do it. And it just happened like political campaigns, they'd be up until like 11, 12 o'clock at night working and licking stamps and like, you know, making out right. envelopes and making phone calls and stuff like that. And so I was drawn towards that. Um, and in that, I met a lot of really interesting people. You know, I ended up volunteering on the Clinton reelection campaign. Right. And, um, met a ton of people that worked for Clinton, which is what led me, you know, when I was in high school to take an internship. And then when I went to college, oh. um, take an internship at the White House. And that turned into a job and, you know, and then turned into, you know, working for the Democratic National Committee. And I had to, you know, drop out of college because my father had uh, died, you know, shortly after 9-11, right? And um, mm. moved back home and took political campaign jobs down in South Florida. Um, and there was, there was this hidden trauma that like I was filling with like all this other stuff, you know? And it was like, I was just dead set on like making my mom proud, right? Showing my family right. that like, I was going to be the man that my father wasn't to my family unit. And um, that all came tumbling down uh, for me um, 
in about 2003, I was on, I was in Washington, DC. I was hiking um, and I fell and broke my knee, broke my, my ankle uh, and ended up in an urgent care physician's office. And they were like, you're going to need to get that knee checked out. You're going to need to get an MRI at some point. But in the meantime, here's something for the pain. Um, and they prescribed mm. me uh, yeah. uh, hydromorphone, uh, which is also under the brand name Dilaudid, which is a really high grade opioid. Um, and I remember taking it that first time, you know, and um, it took away all the physical pain, but it mm. also started to like take away these layers of like emotional pain that I was dealing with. And um, packed underneath, underneath all of this too, was, and this was in 2000 and roughly around like 2001, 2002, um, I was like in the midst of like a massive sexual identity crisis, right? So like yeah. I, you know, had girlfriends and I had dated women and like I, you know, my mom had like kind of picked out the one she wanted me to marry. It was <laughs> like, you know, one of my dear friends for a long time that, you know, her name was Rhonda. Right. We're like best friends today still. <laughs> and like I had this like huge deep, dark secret that I was not straight. You know, I didn't know right. what I was at the time, but I knew that I right. wasn't straight. And, um, but it was not, it wasn't something that I felt comfortable talking to even to my family. And so mm -hmm. there was like all this mess going on. And the crux of the story was when I had moved back home to Florida, um, I went to my primary care physician and I was like, Hey, I've got this problem with my knee and my ankle. And I'm on this pain medication. I'm going to need to continue it down here. You know, by this time I was not misusing my prescriptions, but I was sure. using them and like on yeah. a sustained basis. So I you knew you them. needed them. I knew I needed them. Right. I had no, yeah. I, but I didn't think I had a problem. I never was right. like, I have a problem. It was like, this is just something I take that's prescribed by the right. doctor. And I was taking it as prescribed. Right. And, why would, why would you think that was a problem? Right. Well, there was no reason to, you know? Right. And, um, my primary care physician said, well, I don't do that type of medicine. You're going to need to go see a pain specialist. And, um, if you know anything about South Florida, right at that time, <laughs> the um, hotbed. It, it was the hotbed of pill mills. Like yep. it was where, I mean, just the pill mill crisis was just booming. I mean, they called I-95 from Broward County, up yep. to Kentucky, the Oxycontin Express. And, yep. um, I went to a pill mill unbeknownst to me, right? Like I just mm. went to a pain specialist, I ended up being a pill mill and they were like, Hey, you shouldn't be taking this much, you know, Dilaudid. There's this new, uh, medication that's available. Um, it's extended release, you know, very, very small chance you would ever get hooked on it. Less than 1% of people do. It's super safe. It's called Oxycontin. It's a little bit more expensive, mm. but like you won't need to take, you know, three to four pills a day. You could just take two and, and I was like, okay, fine. You know, let's, let's try that. And, um, um, that was, that was that, right. I mean, my journey from, you know, it sounds like a that, scene from dope sick. Yeah. Yeah. That journey I mean, from, from that Oxycontin prescription into like full blown addiction was not protracted whatsoever. You know, it was within six months that I realized I had a real problem. Um, and there's a lot of people listening. To this are going to be, can relate to now. I appreciate the context that you yeah. just did. Cause it's important to understand, you know, the why behind, uh, how you got into this, uh, yeah. got into this mess and then how you got out of it and then what you're doing today. But there's a lot of people that went to doctors for under those premises, you know, injuries and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, it was, marketed as non-addictive. And now we know in hindsight, you know, with horrendous yeah. consequences, you know, it was and quick. it was quick. I yeah. mean, it was, it was quick for me. And the amounts they were prescribing too. I've oh, always yeah. questioned it. I had surgery in my knee. Now this is, this would be, gosh, it was, um, not during the time you were doing yours, but I, you know, my dad's a doctor, so I knew about these things a little bit, but they gave me like a hundred pills mm. for knee surgery. I took them for two days and went to my dad here, take these back. I, I I'm seeing things. I don't want to, I mean, it just, I knew with addictive personality, mm. this is why I've never done drugs Yep. because I'd want to do them all. Well, but I, I wouldn't want to just get high. You know, I didn't make the connection between drug use and why would I? And like, sure. 
you know, whether you call it an addictive personality or like right. adverse childhood, you know, traumatic yeah. events and, and things like that. Right. I mean, my drug use eventually became and misuse became my primary coping tool that turned into just destroying my life completely. You know? Now, were you unable to get prescriptions filled? Is that what yes. forced you on the streets to get, yes. and that's precisely what's happened now with, um, Yep. prescription uh, opioids being cut what in more than half that's exactly um, what happened to me i got cut you know they they i i was i was tagged as a drug user as a problematic drug user by a doctor um i was cut off the supply was cut off i went right to heroin um this was in 2008 2009 um you know almost died as a result of it um hmm. ended up in a lot of cd you know treatment settings and sober livings that weren't really sober and, you know, things like that. And, um, but, you know, by the grace of God and, you know, uh, things that I still don't understand today, you know, Thanksgiving, I mean, literally this week, this week, I mean, I get like emotional when I talk about it, but like this week, eight I years bet. ago, you know, I got on a payphone and there was a place that was able to take me in and it saved my life, you know, were the, I, were the, I, I didn't the expect med to do that. I didn't want, I didn't want help. All I wanted when I made that phone call was a hot meal and somewhere to sleep that night. I had no intention of staying sober whatsoever. Like, so what clicked? It wasn't what clicked. It was, it was, you know, people are like, what? I get this question all the time. They're like, what led you to get help? Like, what was your bottom? And all those things. I'm like, I, I don't have an answer for that because when I, right. when I, reached out. I wasn't reaching out for help. I was reaching out because I was sick of sleeping on the streets and I was cold, yeah. and hungry. And I wanted just, yep. I wanted just a, a, you know, a reprieve for a couple of days so that I could go back sure. out and use. But, you know, what was different for me was I had been in treatment probably way more than half a dozen times over those 10 years. And when I got to this, and it was a public treatment facility that took me because of Medicaid, right? Like Medicaid mm -hmm. saved my life. Um, they put me on buprenorphine. I was just going to ask you that question. Yeah. yeah. They put me on buprenorphine and they didn't shame me for it. They were like, no, you need to take this. <laughs> like you are like. And that was a huge deal for you, right? It saved my life. And that's why harm reduction needs to be heard. Um, well, yeah. I mean, but buprenorphine is treatment. Like it's yeah, true. Treatment. Good point. It's treatment. Yeah. That's one of the things that like we hear a lot from folks too. It's like har harm reduction and buprenorphine are not the same thing. Like buprenorphine is yeah. treatment. Like, and, but you right. hear people who are like, not saying you, but like others who will, who are very educated on this issue, who will say, put harm reduction and buprenorphine in the same sentence. And yeah, that's, I get it. that takes away from like what harm reduction really is like harm reduction. Yeah. Cause harm reduction is getting that person to live another day. It's like, that's what right. do we need to do? I keep going back to Seth in that hotel room, you know, now obviously he was by himself, his doors were locked. So I, there wasn't anybody there to give him, you know, uh, Narcan and naloxone, which we can talk about in a minute. Cause I have a couple questions on that, but it's like, you know, I have bucked heads with some people that have talked about these, these, these things things that supposedly look like, well, aren't we giving drugs to get them off drugs? That doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, it doesn't have to make sense. If it keeps them alive for another day, maybe that's the day they decide to be sober. Like you had, you I had one day. Some of it, you know, and you know me, I mean, we, we know each other now for a while and you, you yeah. know, I hear things and I'm, I, you know, I'm not one to, to shy away from pushing back on. No, you're not. <laughs> And, um, I mean, we That's saw, what I had you on my panel. I want, I wanted, afraid. cause I you're not afraid of, before, yep. you know, it was like, but we can have civil discourse around things yeah. to disagree on. And that's important because yep. debate is important, particularly on this issue. And there hasn't been enough of it, but, um, harm. I mean, you think about it and it's like harm reduction. I mean, at, at its core tenant is like about radical love, right? It's about right. loving someone and just showing up for them until they can show up for their self, for themselves. And mm -hmm. whatever method that is that we have to use, no matter how taboo it is, like what's the value of a human life? Like, are we willing yeah. to, you know, deconstruct these really old ideas, you know, and deconstruct these, this old ideology that has existed for decades now that isn't working and deconstruct that in, in deference to saving a human life. And that's hmm. how simple it is for me. It's like, 
you know, you want to talk about safe consumption. Great. You want to talk about syringe exchange. Great. We want to talk about, you know, overdose prevention sites and like, let, let's, talk, let's put the cards on the table. Like, do you believe in the value of a human life or not? Period. Yeah. You know? And until you have actually lived that, like you did with yourself, I did with my son, you know, a lot of people out there that are you know, giving their opinions and their medical credentials, they, they, they haven't had a, a family member to die or a family member they've taken to rehab. And, um, it, it's, I guess it, when you walk in someone else's shoes, that whole ideology that, uh, it changes your perspective, but, you know, going back to, um, the issue at hand today with when Seth died, there was 46,000 Americans had overdosed and today it's 108. So we know more about fentanyl. We know more about all these things, but people are dying at a much higher clip. So with the settlement coming, I want to talk about that. Cause I know you were, you were very instrumental in, in getting, um, you know, us and, and, uh, getting the, holding the people accountable, mm -hmm. specifically the Sacklers and, uh, Purdue pharmaceutical. And then these, I don't know, is it 50 something billion dollars? If you count CVS and Walgreens and Walmart, that yeah, it's, it's going to be 50, given out 50, 55 billion. Yep. yep. Where is this money going, Ryan? And how do we know it's going to be spent correctly in the right places? Well, I mean, first and foremost, it's not that much money, right? Because right, it, I agree it, with it that. Sounds, you know, fifty to fifty-five billion dollars sounds like a lot of money on its face, but at the end of the day, you know, these settlements are going to be paid out between you know eighteen to twenty years, divvied up amongst fifty states and thousands of municipalities and corporate yeah. creditors and uh, corporate entities and, you know, individual, you know, hopefully individual payouts in, in some of the bankruptcy cases. Right. Um, it's just not that much. It, it's nowhere near enough money. Um, I think the jury will be out on if we did it right for another 10 years. Um, mm. God knows that we didn't do tobacco, right. That there was a lot of missteps yeah. there. Um, yeah. I will tell you that I've, I've seen, you know, a few indicators that, you know, put red flags up in terms of transparency, because there really is no easy way to track how each individual state is spending their dollars. And layered on top of that, there's no easy way to, or transparent way to really see how they're even determining to spend those dollars. Um, some of the states, if you look at Arkansas, they're doing something very interesting um, that, that, that I'm a fan of, which is having more of an open application process. Uh, like yeah. a great process, um, right. you know, for folks to apply and, and be able to get access to these, to, to these funds. Um, but I'm worried about it too. Look, I mean, I was on the inside for two and a half years, you know, know. on the, the Purdue case, um, you know, and I'm, I'm just as concerned as the next person on this. Um, but I don't, but I, but I think regardless of all that, whether or not, if they spent, let's just let's just start at the premise that they spend every single dollar perfectly, right? That like mm -hmm. every dollar goes to direct service and there's not a penny of waste in any of this, which we know is, you know, probably a far cry from what's going to happen, but let's right. say they do it perfectly. It's nowhere near enough to make a dent. Um, we have been, you know, on the ground, I think advocates, and I know me since 2019 calling for 10, billion dollars per year with a minimum 10 year commitment right which mm. would be a hundred billion dollars over 10 years that we know would make like a crack in the debt right i mean the the trillions of dollars it costs to the economy you know um you would think it would be like a, a no-brainer uh to do right. this but it's one of the hardest it's one of the hardest things we've done right and as a one of the things about the opioid litigation that's frustrated me the most has been, it has been used as like this great political talking point of like what people are doing or what policymakers are doing to help abate the crisis, to help turn the tide on overdoses. And my kind of screaming from the rooftops on this is like, great, but this money should be supplementing substantial dollars we should already be getting. Because I'm a mm. taxpayer, you're a taxpayer, 
Mm-hmm. Most people who are listening to this or watching this are taxpayers. I pay taxes to my state. I pay taxes to my mm-hmm. government. We should be receiving, you know, uh, treatment on demand, equitable health care services, recovery community organizations, housing for people, you know, who are seeking or early in recovery, harm reduction services, like all these things we pay taxes for. So like, why are our health care needs any less than health care needs mm. for, you know, any other chronic disease? That, that's a really good point. Um, I know in our tour that we did, I did a number of stops at recovery community centers, which seem to be propping up all over the country. We have four in Iowa now. Iowa's just like a horrendous state when it comes to this stuff. We're so far you know, behind the eight ball. We still have fentanyl test strips that are illegal here. That's crazy. Which is, yeah. I, <laughs> and I tried to get the governor to even go to our event, our kickoff in Des Moines, and she didn't show up. Um, and I don't know if their head's in the sand. Obviously it is. Mm-hmm. where something like fentanyl test strips can even be a political uh, bargaining sure. chip. It's like, you know, really? Um, but yeah, that's that's Iowa. So, But when I went around the country to some other states and organizations that really were open-minded in some of these things, I was going to segue a little bit into alternative methods, alternative options, because, you know, there's lots of things we can, we can look at the, the supply side, obviously the the, the supply of these things on the streets is a huge concern, but going back to the demand side, you know, why people are using these things. What's your thoughts on some of the, I don't want to say new research, because especially with psychedelics, it's been around since the seventies, but using, you know, psychedelics for possible addiction, uh, you know, uh, not therapy, but, but working with people who have addiction issues because psychedelics have seen, and I've never done drugs, full disclosure, but doesn't mean I'm not curious on options, but, if, if this is that big a crisis and we're in epidemic mode, then I think all hands are on deck. All options should be on the table. What are your thoughts on, on two things specifically, psychedelic research and uh, brainwave technology research for addiction? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, particular to those, those two for me, I'm probably one of the biggest fans out there of what I call recovery choice, right? Like we need more mm. choices or more options for folks. Uh, I like that. You know. But also saying that, like, you know, that doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody, right? Right. So the reason we need more choice is because we have such limited options as it already exists. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, my prescribed pathway is abstinence. You know, I... Yeah, mine too. Buprenorphine buprenorphine got me on my feet. I was on it for several months. Um, I've, you know, been abstinent um, for some time now. Uh, since February 2nd, 2015, um, that is my pathway. I have yeah. seen buprenorphine long-term work for many people. Um, I have seen other methods work for folks. I think psychedelics, particularly like ketamine, um, mm-hmm. you know, need to be studied more, researched more, you know, and if the, if the data, you know, and some of the, the, the first data points that I've been able to see are very promising. You know, mm-hmm. and if it's headed in the right direction, then yes, we absolutely should be utilizing it as a tool. It's another tool in the tool belt. You know, um, I'm not adverse to that whatsoever. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that, again, it's deconstructing these old ideas um, and kind of these old, you know, uh, uh you know, philosophies around, you know, what is recovery? What should it look like? You know when we talk about multiple pathways of recovery, I'm a strong believer that there's as many pathways to recovery as there are people who need it, you know? Yeah. I love that recovery choices. I, I'm going to, you going to use that going forward because that takes the political aspect of it off the table. Well, think you about know, it. You, and, know, you, uh, go, you go, I got cancer and I go, you know, see yeah. the doctor and doctor's going to yep. you know, uh, examine me and I'm going to get all sorts of testing done. And then they're going to be like, here's, you know, 40 different treatments that we can try and we'll start with this. And if this doesn't work, we'll go to this, you know? And it's like, you know, I mean, it's the same thing with substance use disorder addiction. It's like, if one thing's not working, we should go to the next thing, you know, and we should just keep doing it until something works. Yeah. I, all about choices, obviously that that's a huge thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the recovery space because you seem to be real, that, that's kind of like the, not your main thing, but that's kind of what the Mobilize Recovery Tour was about, was recovery. So will you define for my followers and listeners what your definition of recovery, and I guess there never is an end date, right? I mean, recovery is a lifelong journey. So 
Um, we talk a little bit about your thoughts on, on recovery, um, you know, kind of yeah. what it is and um, why it's important to you. I mean, recovery is a process of change that yields positive results. You know, I keep it that simple for me. It's a process of change that one goes through that will yield, you know, have some sort of net positive result for one's life. Um, I think people have miscategorized recovery as, you know, abstinence. I think people have miscategorized recovery as treatment, you know, hmm. um, yeah. recovery. It's, it's, a, it's a phase of change, you know, that is lifelong. It's a personal and very personal. personal. It's very yeah. personal, you know? Yep. Um, but it, for me, it's that simple. Um, you know, and I think that, that, you know, SAMHSA has got a great definition for it. It's a, it's a working definition that's along the lines of how I just stated it. Um, but I think they're looking to possibly update it even more, uh, in the coming, you know, 2023, 2024. Um, but we've seen, you know, like I, I said, like recovery pathways that are just as diverse as the people who are seeking them. Um, I've seen everything from, you know, folks who utilize faith to, uh, mm you know, Buddhism to medication, uh, meditation, you know, meditation. I mean, you know, family is a huge part of recovery. I think there's one, one kind of driving, uh, uh, common denominator, you know, through all pathways. And that's a sense of community, you know? So I'd say like, while many pathways are different, there's one piece that is very similar, uh, although it may look a little different in each of the pathways and that is community you know, a sense of community is built somehow. And I'm a huge believer that, you know, without community recovery in whatever form or shape it may be is very hard. And I think to piggyback on that, we know from a business perspective that social proof is a, is a very important thing, you know, getting something from your peers. And that's probably why these recovery community centers are sprouting up all over the country. Like I said, we only have four in Iowa and one in Cedar Rapids, but yeah. the fact that they're peer to peer, how is that important to you as, as a person in recovery? Um, I'm abstinent from alcohol. I'm not in recovery from drugs because I've never done drugs, but for someone in recovery, how important is that peer to peer, uh, you know, oh, it's, fellowship? I mean, it's, yeah. So, I mean, peer recovery, you know, in whatever form it may be like, peer, I mean, it, that's where the magic is. Right. I mean, like that's, that's how it works. That's like one of my big you know, uh, um, priority kind of agenda items, I guess you could say is, is more dollars, more supports for peer recovery, right? Peer supports, mm -hmm. you know, those take on, uh, the form of recovery community organizations. They take on the form of harm reduction. You know, there's peers yeah. working in harm reduction, not recovery peers, but like harm reduction peers, right? Um, recovery mm -hmm. housing, you know, I mean, these are things that are, I, I mean, they're, they're essential. Right. I mean, well, just and, grief and support. I mean, well, you being in a group also, with parents that have. Right. And even for, for, for the family, right. The, the, yeah. peers, the family, like, this is why when you hear, look, this isn't to take away from treatment, treatment saved my life. Right. Like we, we right. talk a lot about treatment, but there's a lot of people because of the dynamics of treatment in this country, because of the gap, which is 90%, only 10% who need it actually are able to access it or get it. Peer recovery has probably helped more people than treatment has. <laughs> I would agree. You know, and I would agree, you know, um, there's so many people that have entered recovery, found recovery. Um, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't have access to treatment. It means it's just not realistic. It's not in the cards for most folks. I mean, think about the barriers that exist to treatment, right? Like insurance, you know, oh, yeah. the Huge cost one. of it is just insanity, you know, mm -hmm. um, to get on medication is still very hard today. You know, mm -hmm. um, 60, 60, over 60% of quote unquote qualified treatment providers in this country, like inpatients still don't use medication as like their gold standard for opioid use disorder. I mean, you know, it's mm -hmm. a highly unregulated industry. Um, you know, we have to, if we're going to ever break that, you know, treatment gap, we've got to integrate treatment into the primary healthcare system, uh, which is where it belongs. Right. Um, and of then course, make sure yeah. that we set people up for, you know, the best pathway, uh, sustained pathway for once they're out of treatment, because, you know, the, the revolving door of treatment is real, right? And, and, you know, there's great science out there that says in order for someone, 
you know, before someone actually holds on to sustained recovery, it usually takes about six to seven attempts of treatment. Mine, my number was around seven too, you know? Yeah. Um, but then we're not set up for post-treatment, right? Like we're really set up well for like that acute crisis phase. Um, oh man, but, you're so but, right. You know, but yeah. then it's like, we can, you know, we, we know what to do. You know, it's like, get them treatment, get them on medication, get them to inpatient, yep. get them into outpatient, you know, but then what do you do when that's over? Like we call this a chronic yeah. healthcare condition, but we have zero, very little chronic healthcare supports. Those are our peer supports. That's the infrastructure we should be building in, you know? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree a more. Workforce, a workforce of, I mean, you know, in 2020, uh, some of the presidential candidates that we're running, we're talking about like a $70, $80 million investment just into a peer workforce in this country so that we could train up peers, qualified peers to be working with folks. Mm. You know, they could help um, cut that, you know, disparity in treatment, uh, I believe, in half quickly, you know? Hmm. You look at the rates of uh, people that go to AA and it's like less ten, less than 10% or something, um, you know, is, is successful. I don't, I don't know how they gauge well, that number I mean, to be honest with you. you know, Cause it's AA, probably an arbitrary number that people yeah, can pick I mean, and choose AA, on. They talk about, look, AA doesn't have great data because AA is not meant to be studied, you know? Correct. And it, and it's it, very it's secretive. Like, it's, yep. it's just like, yep. that's just how it is. It's not meant to be studied and peer reviewed. And although there is some good data right. out on it, it's yep. about two to 3 million people in 12 step fellowships you know, we've got about 23, 24 million Americans who self-identify as being in recovery. I actually believe that number is much higher. You know, I do, I do too. Know, government data does a lot of underreporting, and there's a lot of barriers to getting accurate right. data. But you know, this may be a surprise or not a surprise, but the majority of people, Americans, who find recovery is something called natural recovery. Right? It's like they once had a problem with drugs or alcohol, That's, and they have yeah. resolved it. Period. That's that. That's my story. I quit for my wife. Like you said, you quit for some reason. It's like I quit to support my wife when our son died, yeah. not knowing that it just became easy for me not to drink. And I've been drinking since eighth grade. So I, you're right. I didn't quit for Jeff Johnston. I quit. A, I was feeling like crap all the time, but I didn't have any desire to quit forever. And and I realized after a few months, Ryan, it's like it's easier for me to start drinking again. Mm. You know quitting was not that, it wasn't that hard. I mean, so, um, I do agree with that a lot. I think you told me that when I was in San Diego, you said, Jeff, I said, I quit cold Turkey. That's really rare. And you said, no, it's not Jeff. All right, it's the most Actually, there's common. more people that do yeah. that than you think. It's the most common. And you were the one that told me that it, it, it's the most common form of recovery out there. But why don't we talk about that? Why don't we give people that yeah. confidence that they can do it? You know? Sure. I mean, we need to, I, I try to talk about it all the time. I mean, it feels, I know you do. You know, um, I, I, it's an important part of the conversation. Um, so, you know, and that's also like there are I think it's important for people to realize there's also categories of like addiction, categories of substance use disorder. Like there's oh, yeah. mild, moderate, there's severe, yep. you know, like, you know, yep. there's DSM, you know, criteria yep. for treatment. You know, I mean, there's, there, you know, not it's not one bucket, you know, that of all SUD. But we're trying to boilerplate. The, the causation and the symptoms and the cure, mm -hmm. like in, like there's a template out there and it's not like you said, we have, we have this toolbox or I call it a quiver with arrows in it. And it's like, we want to have as many arrows as we can in that quiver. So when that beast shows up literally on the front door, whether it's heroin, alcohol, gambling, you know, sex addiction, eating, whatever it is that you, you can slay that beast metaphorically and move on. Let me, before I know we got about 10 minutes and, and you got to go, um, I wanted to ask you because I've, I've got very interested on Twitter. Some of these debates that are going on. Oh, I don't Twitter. comment. Oh, that's story. Right. I'm not like that you. I don't, I don't know Jeff very often. <laughs> it is now. It is. Oh man. I shouldn't have brought that up. Okay. Social media. Let me just say social media on this, this, uh, this Narcan, uh, versus, um, Cloxado. Um, and obviously they're both naloxone, you know, mm -hmm. products per se, or, or you're talking about the I four versus the eight milligram. That's it. And and yeah. I've got people I follow that I really respect that say Cloxado is like the kiss of death and it's just, it's terrible. And then I've got Narcan advocates and it's like, you know what, Ryan, if anyone would know, or you have an opinion on this that I really respect, it'd be Ryan Hampton. The floor is yours. Yeah. I mean, I would say the eight milligram, I mean, 
I was involved. I mean, I, I heard a lot of these pitches from these companies because uh, Purdue actually wanted to, I believe did come out with a version of an eight milligram Narcan um, out of their bankrupt company as part of their, their <laughs> settlement. Um, God bless them, right? I, I, yeah, right. I mean, I'm not too much of a fan of the eight milligrams and I'll tell you why. Um, mm -hmm. People there, you could administer eight milligrams to someone if they needed it. You don't need to do it in one shot though. Um, mm. The, for folks who are overdosing or are knotted out or are unconscious and you're bringing them back with Narcan, um, the more you give them that's unnecessary, the more painful it is going to be for them when they come out. That's what right? I read. Yeah. So Narcan, when you come out of an overdose, depending on how high your tolerance is of the opioid you're using or how much your, your receptors are mm -hmm. eating off of it at that moment, um, it can be like brutal hell. Like you need to be in a safe space. If you now you've been saved by Narcan, right? You go into what they call precipitated withdrawal and you go into it. Like what usually is, I mean, it's happened to me, right? When I was uh, using right. Narcan when I didn't need it. Um, I was not going to die. Someone gave it to me because they thought I was going to die. I was alive. Um, it, it takes about two weeks worth of detox and it makes it makes that two weeks, that intense two weeks happen in about six hours. So like you ball all that up in a rubber band, it's that intense for the person that's going through it. So it's like really not safe for someone to go through that type of detox on their own. Right. Um, if they're not in like a medical setting to be, you know, that's, that's being monitored, you know, people I I've, I mean, I've talked about it. Like I, I've, when I was going through detox, I remember when I had been in precipitated withdrawal from Narcan, um, I was so insane in my head because of the intense withdrawal I was going through that I like contemplate, like, I want to kill myself. Like it's that, right. Right. you know, you feel like you're going nuts. Um, so it's not. It, it may sound safe, like, hey, you know, we're going to, you know, we may need it because of fentanyl. But like the honest to God truth is, is you could have two milligram Narcan sprays or like, or you could have two milligram IM, you know, shots to give someone. And if you think someone's overdosing, give them the first shot. If they don't come up, give them the second one. If they don't come up. And you say second first, shot, you mean on the same the same, uh, or do you have to have a second, a second? When I say uh, shot, I'm talking about like, I, like, I'm a big fan of the intramuscular naloxone as opposed to the nasal, because with the intramuscular. Cause the nasal is the one that's mostly out there, right? It's mostly out there. So like, that's why it's like, you can give someone the nasal in the nose. And if one doesn't work, then you go to two, right. And you could just keep I, upping it as, as needed. I think the devil's advocate, the, the people that are kind of saying the opposite is that, well, the, the average, probably 99% of the people that actually have to use, and I would be one of them because I've never had to use it, um, really are in panic mode. They don't know what to do. They don't know why the person's laying there mm. and they're just trying to help. And they're so not, you it's know, it's interesting where you see like the two different sides. I wouldn't call it an argument, like, but the two right, I agree. sides of this, the I agree. Two different sides of this, as we see sometimes in other things like harm reduction too, right? Is like the majority of it is, you know, person administrating versus person receiving. So it's like, you know, right. you won't hear from one drug user out there or many people in recovery who are like, yeah, eight milligrams right off the bat is a good idea because most of us have experienced what that feels like, you know, hmm. when it's, that's why I wanted to bring this up. Yeah. I want, cause you are a voice of reason and I respect what you're saying, but the, some of the stuff I've been kind of pulled into, I, mean, would you I, give, I get, I get confused as an advocate. Yeah. I mean, you think about like, think about it in terms of like antibiotics or like any other medication, like, would you always start with the highest dose? And then like, you know, like you usually, you, you start with a low dose and if it doesn't work, you go up and you go up and you go up. And like, luckily with Narcan and naloxone, you could do that within two seconds. Yeah. You know, like you yeah. don't need to start with eight, you know, you could start with two or four and then wait, work your way up if needed. What percentage of the population out there is prepared for an overdose um, that, that has Narcan, right? Is it like less than 1%? Oh God. I mean, there's, it, I don't think it's been measured. 
you know, I mean, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, and the reason I asked that is that, you know, if you're that person overdosed, I guess you're really not going to care if it's eight or four because <laughs> well, you want to live. There's a, but there's, I would say one of the things we've advocated for and will continue to advocate for that I think is a game changer is OTC, right? Making naloxone Narcan over the counter. So like you think yeah. about, I think about Narcan in the same you know spectrum as like condoms almost. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. great. You've got this thing out there that could prevent HIV or could prevent an overdose, but people, it's still just kind of like taboo to folks, particularly like mm. parents or someone who has a kid. Cause like, they don't want to admit, like nobody wants to like mom or Susie whose kids using drugs doesn't want to go into the community, you know, pharmacy where she's known the pharmacist for 20 years and be like, Hey, Mr. Pharmacist, can I get some naloxone? They're going to be like, well, what's right. wrong with you know? And right. like, they want to be able right. to discreetly just go pick it up and have it. And like, right. that's how it should be. So I think if we, you know, while it's hard to measure how many people are prepared, if the FDA allowed, which they're making moves towards, by the way, just in the last week, if we allowed Narcan to be over the counter and just had it in every pharmacy where people, because you can't, there's no adverse effect from using it. You <laughs> it's like the biggest no brainer right? of like all time. <laughs> right? It's like Afrin. <laughs> I know. People use to, to clear their noses. So it's, it's like, if we had that over the yeah. counter with like a warning label on it, right. or, you know, I mean, we'd be way more prepared. <laughs> right. You know, how many doses did you hand out on your tour? So we handed out uh, 10,000 overdose aid kits, which include naloxone and about 11,000 fentanyl test strips. Yeah. it's awesome, man. That's awesome. We've done, we've done, so Mobilize Recovery, the Voices Project has given out over a half a million free naloxone kits just in the last three years um, combined through, through all the work and the programs we run in about well, 20, I, 23 states. Living undeterred is certainly always available to support you guys, um, what you're doing. You know, I just, um, was so honored that we were able to, you know, cross paths on, on some, you know, uh, our tour was, uh, you know, a different type of tour. Um, but at the end of the day, I I'm all about saving lives and, same mission, um, though, you know, yeah, it is the same you mission know, and it's two different, know. two different messengers, but <laughs> two we got the same the mission, same coin, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, it was an honor to come up and support you in Minneapolis. And I met Jeremiah and I'm hoping to take our RV up and do a, do a stop up there when we're trying to redesign. I know you guys are working on your tour for next, uh, no next tour, year, correct? We're not doing a tour next year, but we will be doing something. It won't be, we're, we're not, we're, we're going to put the, for, for lack of a better term, the brakes on the bus for yeah. a little bit. And, we'll, and I'll talk we to you about that. Cause, it, but I don't yeah. think, I don't think it'll be 2023. We're doing really short tours. Like we're doing three, 10 to 14 day jaunts, uh, South, West and East and, and kind of pinpoint, go back to some of the stops that really supported us and the ones that were really there and have a lot more, uh, time in the community, maybe spend two days there one day doing our stop. The next is actually going out and advocating on, you know, literally on the streets, helping out the people there. Excellent. So that's what our team is putting together. And, um, I'll certainly be able to talk to you more about that, but well, you can um, count us, Jeff, you can count us in on all of it. We're, you know, Mobilize Recovery is ready to be a partner and is a partner on anything living on the tour, on the tour does. You're a great resource, a great friend. Um, I'm, you know, it's one of the high points of 2022 for me was really not just getting to meet you, but getting to know you and what makes you tick. Um, and um, that's one of the things about this work, you know, that, that, that makes it worth it is just the people you meet along the way who, uh, you know, you become friends with and, and really, uh, get to work with each other. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for everything you do. Yeah. Well, I don't know anybody who works any harder than me, but you do. And, um, I, I, I am attracted to people like that uh, on all topics, not just recovery and overdose and all that. It's, um, passionate people. And that's why my saying purpose becomes passion when it gets personal. Yeah. You know, for you, this is very personal for me. It's very personal for everyone watching. This, this is very personal. I have a couple of just different questions. Have you read Matthew Perry's book yet? No, it is on my I'm halfway through it, it man. Was, it's it really on good. My reading list for vacation. <laughs> it, I'm halfway uh, through it. It's really good. Really yeah, good. I adore him anyway. I mean, I've adored him for, a I, while. I didn't know all this about him. I had no idea this. Was, I, I knew he was in rehab and stuff, but the, he gets very just, Early on in the book, uh, real intimate, which I got a lot of respect for him. 
Yeah, I can't wait to read it. I can't wait to read it. I think he's gonna, you know, anybody you get at that level that comes out and talks about. Well, there you go, Jeff. There's a, there's an assignment for us coming out of this. Like between us, one of us is gonna get to him and recruit him into this cause. <laughs> you know? Dude, I I will do everything I can. I I have a I have a list here of like a hundred, you know, people I'm gonna before Add I to die. The board. I Add it to the board. Add it to the vision board. <laughs> I got Alice Cooper crossed off, and uh, I know you met some. You know, you got introduced by Bill Clinton, man. It's like, tell me, give me a break. I'm up there texting my friends, going, "Yeah, I'm hanging out with a guy that's actually being introduced by President Bill Clinton." You know, it's not the other way around. But He's a great, great um, champion for this cause. Great champion. So I know we're up against the gun. Um, do you have an end game? Do you have a? Do you have a? Do you yeah. have an overall go out of, objective? What a business, man. Amen. Business. Put myself out of business, nonprofit. There's nothing more than I'd love to do than to just put the closed sign on this whole operation. Like the end game should be to go out of business. Do you work on your self care every day? Every day? No, I'll be brutally honest. Um, (laughs) But I've been much better with it um, over the last year. I'm really making, I'm really making intentional space for it. Well, having conversations like this is my self-care. This is my, my therapy is, you know, spending time to talk to people about these things. It means, it means a lot to me. You took an hour of your time. I know you're super busy or you have holidays coming up. I want you to, uh, really enjoy the holidays. When's your wedding date again? March 18th, 2023. <laughs> I'll have that circle on my calendar. Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm really, I'm really happy for you. I'm really happy for you. Are you, are you nervous? No, we, I mean, we've lived together for three years. We've been together for over four years. So it's like, we're married. I mean, we're, we're like, we're like, we're basically married. We just need to to have a ceremony at this point, you know? (laughs) Yeah. It's a formality at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Any last things you want to add as we wrap up the show, Ryan? Yeah. Just don't give up. Anybody who's listening, don't give up. Keep believing there's, you know, um, an army of people out there, uh, who, you know, are working to, um, you know, end these catastrophic losses and, and make things better. And um, if anything I've said or Jeff does or any of this rings true to you, reach out to one of us and get involved. Like we need more people. Well, I appreciate you keynoting our expo coming up on May 6th. I know you're going to be a guest on my radio show and I know people are going to want to have you back on the Living on a Turd podcast. I'd so. love to. 2023. Have a great, again. <laughs> you bet brother. Have a great, have a great holiday and uh, I love you, man. Thanks, Jeff. Talk to you soon.